Hello and welcome to the Daily News Simplified. The work, why and how of the newspaper launches from a civil service examination's perspective. So today, we are going to discuss the Hindu Delhi edition dated 16th February 2023. The important topics which are to be discussed have been displayed on the screen and a time stamping of the same has been provided in the description box below. So now, let us begin our today's session. So first, before starting our today's session, let us have a look at the question for the main's weekly answer writing practice. The question says, safeguarding the Indian geo heritage is the need of the moment. In the light of this statement, analyze the role of draft geo heritage sites and geo relics, preservation and maintenance bill 2022 in the protection of geo heritage in India. This is a long question. That is why you have to answer this particular question within the word limit of 250. So this is a 15 marker question. In order to better attempt this question, you are requested to go back to the DNS dated 14th February 2023, whereby Jatin sir has discussed in detail about all the possible dimensions related to this particular bill. He has discussed that what is the need of such a bill, what is the objective of this bill, what is the definition of geo heritage sites as well as geo relics and the benefits of such bill? So, in order to write beautiful answers to this particular question, go back to the DNS dated 14th February 2023, revise it, and then attempt this particular question to get it evaluated by our evaluation experts and to have the assessment of your own answer writing skills. So we are starting with our today's first topic, which is from the geography section. This topic has appeared in today's The Hindu Daily Edition at page number 13. And the topic reads, Warm Water Melts Antarctica's Glacier. This topic has been in the news because of the recent context that certain studies have been conducted by scientists and they have said that the Thwaites Glacier, which is popularly named as Doomsday Glacier. Now, this term you people might have read in your newspapers or in some other books or texts which you people are referring. This Doomsday Glacier. So, the study says that this Doomsday Glacier is warming up and will melt completely in coming years. And this has primarily because of the global warming or the rising temperatures. Now, if you go by the UPSC scheme of syllabus, it clearly mentions in General Studies Mains Paper 1 in the Geography section, changes in the critical geographical features including the water bodies and ice caps and their effects or the consequences of such changes. So that is why in today's session, we will be specifically talking about this particular dimension that is the glaciers. The changes in these glaciers as far as the Antarctica continent is concerned. We all know that there are three poles. One is the North Pole, one is the South Pole and the third pole are the Himalayas where we find thousands of glaciers. So the impact of the climate change on all these ice caps is almost similar. However, today's session is restricted in the sense that we will be discussing only the South Pole that is Antarctica as a continent and the melting of the glaciers, ice sheets or ice caps on that very continent. So first concentrate on this very map. This is the map of Antarctica which is divided in two parts. One is the East Antarctica and other is the Western part. Now there are several islands and several ice shelves for example, Emery Ice Shelf, West Ice Shelf, etc. on this particular continent. As far as the prelims examination is concerned, you need to be aware about certain names of the islands or seas or ice shelves on this Antarctica. So from that very perspective, let us look at some of the important names which now and then regularly appears in the newspapers. So first is this, Emery Ice Shelf. Remember it is on the eastern part of Antarctica. Second important is the Ross Ice Shelf. Then we have Thwaites Islands or the Thwaites Glacier and this Thwaites Glacier is known as the Doomsday Glacier. Then we have an important island, Pine Island. We also have Wilkins and the Larsen Sea Ice Shelf. So, as far as the Thwaites Glacier or the Doomsday Glacier is concerned, it is on the 
western antarctica part western antarctica part now this is the map of this particular one glacier which we are discussing today as far as the size of this glacier is concerned it is almost equivalent to the size of the great britain so you yourself imagine that just one glacier is almost equal to the size of the great britain so if there is a rise in the temperature because of the global warming and this entire glacier melts just imagine the consequences on various aspects for example the sea level as well as there will be several consequences which we will be discussing in the later part of today's session just imagine that what impacts the melting of such a large glacier can lead to however from the prelims examinations perspective two important seas that is amundsen sea and the ross sea this is also important the questions can be asked in the sense that where these seas are located or in which part of the world we find these seas so remember amundsen sea and the ross sea are in the antarctica part so before starting today's session we will be dealing not just with the environmental aspect but we will be also be dealing with the geographical aspects or certain concepts which are there there are three important concepts one is the ice sheet second is the ice shelf and third is the boundary line so let us see that what are these concepts only then you will be in a better position to understand that how this whole process of global warming is related to the melting of these things what is the role of ocean movements what is the role of deep water circulations atmospheric circulations how these all things like oceans glaciers as well as atmospheres how these things are related to each other so we will be discussing all these concepts with the help of diagram i will be drawing this rough diagram of these ice sheets and ice shelves in the antarctica so first let us imagine that this is the ocean bottom floor because ocean bottom floor it's itself is also uneven so let us imagine that this is the ocean bottom floor correct now because we are talking about the south pole so starting from the ocean bottom floor all the water would have been frozen correct so the rough structure is somewhat like this there are two parts of the ice or the glaciers which we find in the south pole let us say this is antarctica so the first part is that part of the ice which is starting just from the ocean bottom floor and reaching up to the topmost surface which is visible to our naked eyes clear so the glacier is present or the ice is present from the surface to the ocean bottom floors and then there is an eventual outlet of this ice which is floating in the ocean water let us say that this is the ocean water so the part of the ice which is floating in the ocean water that part of the ice is known as ice shelf so basically this part is the ice shelf and this part is the ice sheet and the glaciers are also moving in this direction because these ice shelves are continuously fed by the glaciers which are moving in this direction towards the ocean water bodies and this is the floating part this is the rigid part is this clear so this is the ice sheet and this is the ice shelf now there is one line this particular line which is dividing this floating part and the part which is continuously attached to the bottom floor this particular line is known as boundary line and the zone between this ice sheet and the ice shelf that is between this part and let us assume this part beyond this there is an ice shelf so the zone between the ice sheet and the ice shelf is known as the boundary zone okay so this part is clear to all of you now let us see what happens now we all know that there is a global warming which is going on across the world various reports for example ipcc unep etc have confirmed this fact because of this global warming and the greenhouse effect there is a average increase in the temperature 
at all the parts of the world correct because of this rise in temperature the ocean waters are also warming up and if there is an ocean warming that means that the ocean currents are also warming up so what will happen is that because of the warming of this ocean water there will be the melting of the ice shelf this ice shelf will start melting however this is not of the major concern as far as the immediate context is concerned the reason being this ice shelf is already floating in the ocean so its melting will not drastically increase the sea level okay its melting will not drastically increase the sea level because it is already floating in the ocean water but what will happen is that let us assume that this ocean water is moving towards this direction this is the warm water it will expulse the cold water outwards so the cold water will be moving towards the ocean the warm water will be moving towards the ice or the ice sheet part as soon as the ice shelves will melt this will recede okay so just imagine that earlier the ice shelf was here now it has melted and new ice shelf has receded back okay similarly with further melting the ice shelf has receded back and a time will come when this warm water will hit this particular boundary line also okay now if this boundary line is hit by the warm water this boundary line will also start receding earlier it was here now it has receded to this part eventually it will recede to this part and a time will come when this whole boundary line will be melted and whole this ice sheet which earlier was not floating in the water now will be in the ocean water and because of the melting of this ice sheet there will be drastic increase in the sea levels so in the previous dns we learned about deep water circulations if you people have not seen that dns so i request you to go back to that dns that dns has been shown on your screen see the date and go and understand the concepts of the deep water circulations however coming back to today's session we learned about the deep water circulations and their motions the reason behind it so what is happening because of the global warming the deep water circulations are entering towards the south pole they are entering towards this boundary line of various glaciers which are present in the antarctica continent these are the deep water circulations okay and therefore this warm deep water circulations further is also melting this boundary line so that is how the process of the melting of ice sheets and ice shelves is going on in the antarctica continent that is in the south pole now the question arises that what will be the consequences of these things before discussing it let us have a look at the standard diagram also so if you see these diagrams this is the direction of the ice flow as we have discussed this is the bottom floor this is the grounding line we have discussed this concept also these are the glacial marine muds the muds which are formed out of the marine deposits as well as the glacial deposits are known as glacial marine muds obviously these are formed at the basin or the at the ocean basin floor this is the ocean water this is the melting under the ice shelf this floating part is known as the ice shelf this is the sea level these are the ice sheets because of the global warming this warm circumpolar deep water is flowing under the ice shelf in this particular direction the cold water is being expelled out towards the ocean and because of the continuous melting of this ice shelf there are certain left over or the remnant parts which are known as the icebergs these eventually lead to the formation of sea ice formation okay so we have discussed this particular diagram with the handmade diagrams also handmade diagrams are basically important for you people because obviously in the mains answer you will not be making the exact diagram like this but you will be making a diagram like this only okay and these are perfectly acceptable now we have discussed this with the help of standard diagrams also we will move in towards what can be the possible consequences of this glacier melting 
the first and the foremost or the most immediate consequence is the rise in the sea level we have discussed this part conceptually also that if the ice shelves or the ice sheets are melting it will lead to sea level rise and scientists are of the firm opinion for example let's say here we are talking just about the doomsday glacier now have you ever thought that why this glacier that twice glacier in popular terminology is known as doomsday glacier what is the doomsday so doomsday is basically the last day of the existence obviously this has a metaphorical meaning but obviously it has a logic that this particular glacier the twice glacier is so important that if this whole glacier melts then that will be the last day of our existence and that will be the doomsday why it is known as doomsday because scientists believe that if this complete glacier melts just this one glacier there are several hundreds and thousands of glaciers across the world but just one glacier that is this twice glacier doomsday glacier if it melts just this single glacier can lead to increase in the global sea level by more than half meters this is the potential of this particular glacier okay across the world whole sea level will rise more than half a meter so this is one of the most disastrous consequence that is the sea level rise next in continuation with this comes the flooding so the areas which are most vulnerable to the flooding will obviously be the coastal areas small island states as well as the low lying areas so there are several large cities for example mumbai new york shanghai etc which will be destructed if this glacier melts because these are the cities which are located just on the coastal areas sharing a very high demographic load and therefore will bear the brunt of the sea level rise the third consequence will be release of the greenhouse gases now this point is also very important these ice caps are the storehouse of several amounts of carbon dioxide or equivalent co2 these ice caps are the storehouses of them and therefore they act like the carbon sinks okay so in this context they are similar in functioning when it comes to the natural vegetation for example trees or the forest or the corals they are also the carbon sinks and these glaciers are also carbon sinks so when these glaciers will melt they will release huge amount of co2 equivalent into the atmosphere which earlier they were storing because the melting they now they will not store them and they will release it and if this greenhouse gas is released back into the atmosphere it will again increase the temperature it will again increase the ocean warming it will again melt the glaciers and this melting will again release the greenhouse gases which again will increase the temperature so this vicious cycle will continue and that is why this is known as the positive feedback mechanism that is the output of one system further increases the input of that very system so if we enter into this vicious cycle it will be a never ending cycle the fourth impact is changes in the oceans now this ocean will be changed in two ways one is the effect on the ocean circulations second is the impact on the ocean composition let us understand these also now ocean circulations will be impacted just go with the basics what are ocean currents how do those move ocean currents move because of the differences in the temperature density salinity etc out of these parameters let us take one important component that is temperature now we all know if there is an increase in the temperature the water expands and that is how the ocean currents start moving correct similarly when the temperature is lower the water contracts it subsides and it moves as subsurface current so when the global warming is taking place and the melting of the glaciers are taking place 
it will reduce the thermal contrast between these two water bodies because now there will be lesser cold water okay the thermal contrast will reduce if there is a reduction in thermal contrast then obviously it will be directly impacting the ocean movements also similarly if the fresh water from the glacier is being released into let's say oceans so obviously the fresh water will increase and therefore the salinity of the ocean water will decrease and that is how the composition of these ocean waters will also be affected if salinity of the ocean water is getting affected then obviously it will also impact the density which in turn will again impact the oceanic circulations so ocean circulations as well as oceanic compositions both will be impacted and by this very logic also the atmospheric circulations will also be impacted the reason is similar the logic is same because the global warming is reducing the thermal contrast which in turn will also reduce the pressure contrast between various atmospheric belts between various regions so obviously it will be directly altering the atmospheric circulations also so these are various oceanic as well as atmospheric consequences of the melting of this ice sheets or the ice shells at both the poles so this was the discussion for now this was a little bit lengthy but conceptual topic so we can revise it in brief once again initially we discussed with the help of this map that antarctica has two parts one is the eastern part then is the western part and in this session we are restricting our discussion to the thwaites glacier also known as the doomsday glacier which is roughly equivalent to the size of the great britains with the help of this diagram we understood the important concepts of ice sheets ice shells boundary line as well as boundary zone we discussed that how the movement of the deep water ocean circulations is impacting the ice shelf and how there is a continuous receding of this boundary line with the help of this concept we discuss that how this whole ice sheet can get melt and what consequences can it lead to in terms of sea level rise flooding release of greenhouse gases impacts on ocean circulation and compositions as well as impacts on atmospheric circulations this topic has appeared in today's the hindu daily edition as the lead article on the editorial page the topic reads a manifesto for tackling the silent pandemic of amr this amr stands for anti microbial resistance the immediate context of this very news article is the muscat conference so in this regard we will be dealing with all the possible dimensions associated with anti microbial resistance that what do we mean by anti microbial resistance what are the causes of amr what are the various impacts or the consequences of amr then we will discuss about the key highlights of the muscat conference and the adopted muscat manifesto then we will discuss with the indian efforts to overcome the amr so as far as the upsc scheme of syllabus is concerned this topic is mainly relevant when it comes to general studies mains paper 2 because this section has a component of social justice and under the social justice we have an important component of health so that is why we have taken this topic for today's session also so now without wasting any time let us begin our discussion the first question is that what do you mean by amr what is anti microbial resistance so this name is also suggesting you a direction that what amr could possibly mean this is basically the microorganisms which have developed certain kind of resistance to the anti microbial treatments now this topic amr has gained a lot of significance in today's time this health problem is not because of any disease but is an outcome of the treatments to several diseases yes when we treat any one particular disease we use certain amounts of medications when we continuously use these 
medications or when we tend to irrationally use these medications various bacteria fungi or other microorganisms in the body they develop resistance to these medications this resistance is known as antimicrobial resistance for example antibiotics antifungals antivirals antimalarials when we use all these types of medicines the microbes in our body or the germs which are present in our body they develop the resistance and once they develop the resistance then they cannot be treated by the same amount of antibiotics then we have to increase the dose of antibiotics eventually those microorganisms will again develop the resistance so this vicious cycle goes in on and on and on and that is why at one particular level these microorganisms themselves become super bugs that they develop the resistance to virtually all the types of antibiotics or medicines even the strongest medicines so this is known as the antimicrobial resistance now we shall discuss that what are the various causes of amr first is the misuse or the overuse of several antibiotics or medicines this can be due to several factors for example let us imagine our villages still in several villages across india the doctors which are present they are not really doctors they do not have any professional degrees they are just fake doctors who are also known as quacks and just with their own experience which is not at all scientific in any sense they provide certain prescriptions to the patients who come to them more often they are very wrong prescriptions they are very strong medicines more often they prescribe the use of steroids so this wrong prescription generally develop the entry microbial resistance the second important factor is the covid 19 in the backdrop of covid 19 almost every person has taken certain amount of antibiotic or the irrational combination of certain amount of medicines this problem is very true in the far flung areas in the rural hinterlands in the tribal areas where they do not have access to the scientific medications as well as doctors so this covid 19 pandemic in a way has also increased the amr in our body the third component is the overuse of these medicines in different sectors for example agriculture or dairy for example if we are using a lot of pesticides or fertilizers in our agriculture while growing crops so the components of those fertilizers gets transferred to the food which again gets transferred to the human body similarly the medicines which are provided for example to the cattle are also transferred to milk which eventually find its way to the humans so eventually everything ends in the human gut and they develop antimicrobial resistance the second important component is the incomplete course or the self medication many a times you people have also witnessed this on yourselves or in your family also that when we fell ill we immediately go to the doctor and then we take certain medications from the doctor but after 4 to 5 days when we start feeling healthy i must reinstate this word that we start only feeling healthy that does not mean that we are healthy enough we start feeling healthy then we tend to miss out on that particular course when a lot of medicines are provided by a doctor they are in a certain standard combinations they are in certain ratios which you and me are not aware of so whenever we start feeling healthy after 4 to 5 days we tend to neglect those medicines we tend to neglect the course and this in turn can lead to development of amr third reason is lack of sanitation as well as hygiene for example poor quality of food poor quality of drinking water also contribute to the amr similarly the untreated waste breed several microorganisms which in turn affect the human health further inviting a lot of medication and thus repeating the cycle itself so these are various causes of amr next comes the impact 
first and the foremost impact is that the treatment of various diseases become very difficult for example pneumonia tuberculosis etc these diseases become very difficult to treat once the human body has developed the antimicrobial resistance there are certain reports which say that in case of tuberculosis there has been a 60% of reduction in chance of the recovery of the patients because they have used irrational combination of medicines and have developed antimicrobial resistance up to a huge extent that their chance of recovery has reduced by 60% are you getting it second important impact is the increase in the health cost because if the body has developed amr and the medicines are not able to operate or act on those bodies then obviously the hospitalization will increase earlier let's assume that the patient could have been treated within the span of 10 days but now because he or she has developed amr now 15 days will be taken to cure him and that is why this increase in the 5 days will eventually hit his or her own pocket so the health cost increase because of the increase in hospitalization as well as the later recovery according to world health organization out of the 10 most severe health hazards across the world amr is one of them and this very report also says that in 2019 around 4.5 million deaths across the world were reported in association with the amr that means amr had certain role in 4.5 million deaths across the world so you yourself can imagine the severity the intensity of this very pandemic the third impact is the rise in the communicable diseases icmr that is indian council for medical research in 2022 report has said that every year because of this antimicrobial resistance the resistance level in the human body is increasing by 5 to 10% mind you this increases every year okay so this shows the various impacts of antimicrobial resistance and by now i assume that you people have understood the severity and intensity of this very problem and that is where the relevance of the muscat conference comes in so at the muscat conference a muscat manifesto has been adopted this was the third global high level ministerial conference on antimicrobial resistance important information from the prelims perspective muscat manifesto or muscat conference deals with the antimicrobial resistance and has believed on the principle of one health approach it recognized the need to one accelerate the political commitments that is it wants the actions to be taken by various countries to implement the one health approach now what do you mean by one health approach or the one health action this is basically the principle which interlink humans plants as well as animals so the one health approach you can see here requires all the stakeholders to work together towards an integrated program linking the challenges of humans terrestrial and aquatic animals plant health food and feed production as well as the environment when you integrate all these components it becomes the one health approach because we have seen that how the use of pesticides in plants can eventually lead to antimicrobial resistance in humans and animals so this was the first need second it has also recognized the need to address the impact of amr not only on the humans but also on the animals and in the areas of environmental health food security and economic growth and development therefore it has focused on three important health targets with clear cut timelines the first is to reduce the total amount of antimicrobial used in agri food systems at least by 30 to 50% by 2030 okay so one target is for the agri food systems reducing it by 30 to 50% by 2030 second is eliminating the use in animals and food production of antimicrobials that are medically important for human health and third is to ensure that by 2030 at least 60% 
of overall antibiotic consumption in humans is from the WHO access group of antibiotics. So these were the certain targets and the principles which were adopted in the Muscat Manifesto. Now we should also look that what are the various efforts or the steps which are taken by India to overcome the AMR. So there are five important steps. One is the National Action Plan on Antimicrobial Resistance which was between 2017 to 2021. It specifically focused on hand hygiene, sanitation programs, for example, Swachh Bharat Abhyan, Kaya Kal, and Swachh Swast Sarvatra. Further, this national action plan also focused on the One Health Strategy with the goal of incorporating all the stakeholders. And as we all know that community is the basic foundation for the success of any specific program or policy. That is why this national action plan also focused on increasing the community awareness about healthier and better food production practices. The second important step was the national health policy of 2017, which provided for the specific guidelines regarding the use of antibiotics and limiting the use of them. Further, it also provided for the scrutiny of the prescriptions to assess the antibiotic usage in hospitals and among the doctors also. But the question is, are we able to implement the policy objectives of national health policy in 2017 or not? Are we scrutinizing enough the prescriptions of the doctors or not? The third effort which India has taken is the AMR Surveillance and Research Network, which was established in 2013 with the goal of gathering data and identifying the trends and patterns in drug-resilient illness throughout the nation. Further, India has committed to strengthening the surveillance and reporting of data to the WHO Global Antimicrobial Resistance and Use Surveillance System, which is also known as GLASS. This information again is also relevant from the prelims examinations perspective because the question can be asked about this particular acronym that is GLASS. So it deals with the antimicrobial resistance, the program of WHO. Fifth, India also plans to strengthen the private sector engagement and promoting the research on newer drugs. So these are various efforts, but still we must have certain way forward also because challenges still exist. Despite all these programs and schemes, the challenges exist and we are facing the brunt of it. So what should be a way ahead strategy? First is the constant monitoring of antibiotic consumption, which forms the part of scrutiny. Identifying the types and quantities of the antibiotics being used. Second is the policy actions to reduce the usage of antimicrobials in the agri-food systems. Because the scientific evidence proves the fact that lesser the use of antimicrobials, the lesser will be the chances of the development of their resistance. Third is, as we have understood that there is a need for surveillance, so that is why WHO's GLASS platform which we have discussed above, that must be used to its fullest potential. No use of antibiotics for the growth promotion in animals and regulatory and policy actions to stop the use of antibiotics in the animals that are important for human health. Further, more government investment must be done in research and innovation for new antibiotics. Exploring the use of vaccines to prevent certain infections due to AMR with special focus on combating tuberculosis and drug resistant tuberculosis. So this was again a lengthy topic. Let us revise this topic in brief once again. Initially we discussed that what do we, we exactly mean by antimicrobial resistance and we see that how certain microorganisms as a reaction to certain microbial treatments become superbugs. Then we discussed that what are the various causes of AMR. These causes were misuse or overuse of certain medications, incomplete courses of those medications, lack of sanitation and hygiene, as well as untreated waste. Then we discussed the various impacts of AMR on humans, which were in terms of difficult treatment, increasing health cost 
and increase in communicable diseases. Then we came about the certain targets and principles which are adopted in the Muscat Manifesto. The important targets were related to the agri-food systems that is to reduce the antimicrobial usage in these systems by at least 30 to 50 percent by 2030 as well as to ensure that by 2030 at least 60 percent of overall antibiotic consumption in humans is from WHO access group. After this, we saw the Indian efforts to overcome AMR in terms of National Action Plan on Antimicrobial Resistance, National Health Policy 2017, AMR Surveillance and Research Network, India's commitment towards WHO Glass Platform, and India's effort to strengthen private sector engagement. And in this line, in the last, we discussed that what can be a way forward or the strategy ahead which can help us to achieve the goals which are outlined in the Muscat Conference. Now, this topic has appeared at page number two in the brief section. The topic reads, at Khajuraho, an exhibition on repatriated artifacts. Now, this is a very short news article which has appeared in the context that recently the government is taking certain efforts to prevent the illicit trafficking in antiques. As part of this effort, the government has planned to exhibit 23 repatriated Indian antiques in the G20 Cultural Working Group. The stories of these artifacts will be narrated in the virtual reality mode by the 900-year-old Parrot Lady of Khajuraho. Now, from the UPSC examinations perspective, this topic is relevant from the prelims as well as the main section. The questions can be asked in both the papers. For example, from this context, we get a very important factual information that is the sculpture of Parrot Lady. And this belongs to the temples of Khajuraho. So you have to remember this particular thing. Such types of informations are very relevant and very handy when it comes to the prelims examination. But in today's session, we will be discussing in detail about the Khajuraho temples, their historical significance, their architectural design, their structures, their construction materials, etc. So now, let us begin this discussion. These Khajuraho temples were built during the Chandela's dynasty, so keep this thing in mind. One important thing which you should know and most of the people get confused is that Khajuraho is not just one temple, it is basically a group of temples. There are various groups of temples. Okay, so it is not one temple. And therefore, because there are several temples, so different different temples are attributed to different schools of thought. There are certain temples who are devoted to Vaishnavism, certain other temples are devoted to Shaivism, and there are also the Jain temples. That means that these temples are not restricted because there also exist Jain temples. So this Chandela dynasty reached its apogee between 950 to 1050 AD and this is the very time of the construction of these temples. Presently these temples are located in the Vindhyan mountain range in the central India in Kalinjar area. As far as the management is concerned, these group of temples are owned by the government of India and managed by Archaeological Survey of India under various acts, rules and regulations. Now we shall discuss the architecture of these temples. First and foremost, these temples belong to the northern group of temple architecture which is predominantly the Nagar style. So this Nagar style has certain important components which are shown in this diagram. At the topmost position, they have Kalash. The circulatory platform is known as Amalak. This structure, which is the tallest structure of this temple, is known as the Shikhar. This is basically the tower. So, again, topmost is the Kalash. Then we have Amalak. This tower is known as Shikhar. Under this Shikhar, there lies a sanctum or the main shrine, which is known as Garbhagriha. There are certain subsidiary shikhars also. For example, this is the main shikhar and these are the subsidiary shikhars. These subsidiary shikhars are basically for the beautification purposes of this architecture. Then we have Mahamandap or the Great Hall which lies below this particular tower. 
Then we also have certain additional halls which are smaller in size. For example, this which are known as mandaps or ardh mandaps. All the temples face towards the east because the sunrise is considered as a very auspicious moment when it comes to Hinduism. These temples also have a circumambulatory path on which people do pradakshina, and that is why they are also known as pradakshina path. So these are certain components which are listed over here also. As we have already discussed, that temples of Khajuraho are divided into three groups: the western group, the eastern group, and the southern group. Now, for the first time, they were reported by Al Biruni in. 1022 AD and then by Ibn Battuta in 1335 AD as far as the construction material of these temples are concerned they are mainly composed of sandstone with nearly buried granite base these temples are very famous for their sculpture work and they have one of the most erotic sculptural inscriptions within their temple premises at that point of time the erotic expression was considered as a part of the wider cosmic whole and that is why it has been given a similar value in the human experiences as a spiritual quest the bodies have elegant waves and curves of garments and jewelries and these female bodies are basically known as sura sundari so this is an important term again the terminology based questions from the ancient as well as medieval history are very common in prelims examination there are few jain temples as well such as parshavnath temple few of these temples also have panch yatna type of structure now what is panch yatna panch yatna is whereby whereby the main deity lies in the center and they are surrounded by four shrines which are dedicated to divinities so now because there are five components they are known as panch yatana type of architecture the there are also temples devoted to yoginis who are part of tantric worship that means hinduism shaivism jainism as well as the tantric school of thought finds its relevance when it comes to khajuraho temples and this also demonstrates that tantric cult grew and flourished after the 7th century most famous temple is the chausat yogini temple for the tantric worship these temples are so elegant and they have so much of historical significance that they have got the status of the unesco's world heritage site in 1986 so again have a look at the architectural beauty of these temples and these were the certain key facts related to the khajuraho temples which are relevant in prelims as well as the mains examination This topic has appeared at page number 1 in today's newspaper. The topic reads I on China cabinet clears seven ITBP battalions. The immediate context of this Spirin news article is that recently the union cabinet has approved two important decisions. One is the raising of seven new ITBP battalions and allocation of rupees 4800 crores under vibrant village program. now these steps have been taken in the backdrop of the recent rises in the skirmishes between india and china and therefore these steps become important for protecting the india's territorial integrity and sovereignty in this regard from the examinations perspective we will be dealing with two important things first is certain key facts related to the cabinet committee on security as well as the vibrant village program these key facts are relevant as far as the prelims examinations are concerned second important thing which we will be dealing with is about the itbp as a whole because upsc in its general studies mains paper 3 in the section of internal security mentions an important component that is the structure and mandate of various forces so in today's session we will be dealing with various structures and the mandates or the tasks which are assigned to the itbp so let us begin our today's session 
First, the Cabinet Committee on Security is the final decision-making body on senior appointments in the National Security Apparatus, Defence Policy, Expenditure and generally all those matters which deal with the India's national security. So that means it is the topmost body dealing with the security measures of India and that is why its composition comprises of one Prime Minister of the India who is the head of Cabinet Committee on Security. Very important. Second, Defence Minister of India, Home Minister of India, obviously because they are also dealing with the Defence Services, Home Minister because they are also dealing with the internal security and law and order issues. Fourth, Finance Minister because to run all these things you obviously need finance. Fifth is the External Affairs Minister because when it comes to the international security, there must be external affairs ministry to deal with all the countries whether they are in bilateral relationship or the regional relationship. In addition to these ministers, cabinet secretary, national security advisor as well as the defense secretary are also the attendees of the meeting. So keep these things in your mind. These, these are the factual informations related to cabinet committee on security. Second important thing this news article mentions about the Vibrant Village program. Now be very clear that this program is not spreaded across whole of the India. This is restricted to certain areas which share the northern land border. So the villages which are in the border areas and that too on the northern border areas will get the benefit of this very program. The aim of this program is to create the various job opportunities to curb the migration of the local population. It is a centrally sponsored program basically focusing on the local employment, skill development as well as the entrepreneurship. Now last we will discuss about the ITBP. The motto of this Indo-Tibetan Border Police Force Shorya Dhridhata Karmnishtha that is courage, determination and belief on the action. So as the name is clear, Indo-Tibetan Border Police Force. So the prime areas of operation of this police force is the Indo-Tibetan border. Basically, our country believes in one border, one police force. So this is basically done to ensure the specialization and experience of various police forces on their own territories. Okay, so if one police force is deployed at one particular border, they will come to know about the various challenges, their topography, various areas through which insurgents can attack, various hotspots. So being located at a particular location increases the specialization and experience of that particular force. And that is why it was advisable that each border has its own force. So that is why ITBP was raised in 1962. Initially, it was raised under the CRPF Act. However, in 1992, a separate independent parliamentary act was passed for the ITBP. And it was to guard the 3,488 kilometer long India-China borders. Hence, the official tasks or the mandate as per our syllabus for the ITBP is vigil on the northern borders preventing the border violations and promotion of the sense of security among the local population, checking the illegal immigration, trans-border smuggling and crimes, security to sensitive installations, banks and the protected persons in those areas, restoring and preserving the order in any area in the event of disturbance. Further, ITBP forces are also deployed in the relief and rescue operations whenever there are disasters in those areas. Further, they are also involved in several other multifarious postings. For example, they are given the task to protect various installations of the national importance throughout the country. For example, Rashtrapati Bhavan, Vice President House, Rumtek Monastery in Sikkim, Tihar Jail and Labasna. Important one. Labasna. Second, operations against the left-wing extremism in the state of Chhattisgarh. They have also been included in the UN peacekeeping operations in various African countries. 
presently they are also deployed in the Indian Embassy in Kabul. So you can see that they are not restricted on the Indo-China borders only. They are also deployed in the overseas operations including the peacekeeping operations as well as protecting the Indian territories in the foreign lands, for example, Indian embassies. So yeah, this was the factual topic, but these topics are also important because they are mentioned in the syllabus and in regular preparation we tend to miss on these topics.